think that you know what a mineral is, minerals are familiar to all of you. Some of you may be fortunate enough to be wearing diamond rings or emerald rings or rubies or sapphires. Every one of you has probably within the last 24 hours used a mineral in your supper or your lunch or your dinner. You scattered salt on it. That is a mineral. So you're all familiar with minerals. But behind your familiarity with minerals, lurk the complexities of crystal chemistry and mineral structures, atomic structures. It's no good pretending that this is easy stuff. It isn't easy stuff. It's complicated and you're going to find that you've got to make demands on your time if you're to remember the facts that we give you today and you're going to have to do some thinking if you're going to understand them. Uh, there is just no geology without tears, so to speak, just as there isn't French without tears. The importance of minerals is that they are the fundamental parts of rocks. And not only should you know how minerals are put together, but you should also be able to identify minerals. And I hope that you have all already begun to look at your mineral kits. Learning to identify minerals is just as important as knowing what they are. By this time next week, you should be able to recognize 15 or so minerals. The first part of this hour is Animal, Vegetable and Mineral, a film from the Planet of Man series, and then the next half hour looks in more detail at minerals. wonder why we're selling a Chinese junk in northern Canada. The reason is I had a student who went to Hong Kong and there got a pleasure junk and told me what a good boat this would be. And it's proved to be an excellent boat, seaworthy and robust, admirably suited for these rather treacherous waters with their many shoals and rocks and uh, quite strong uh, winds and waves. All right, uh, Ken, you can let it go. Not much wind. Everyone knows that the ocean is made of water. What is the solid part of the earth made of? It's made of minerals. Diamond is a mineral. Quartz is a mineral. But there are lots of other less exotic minerals. And these make up the mountains, the cliffs, the sand, all the parts of the solid earth we live on. This program will attempt to explain what is a mineral. This came out of the earth. It is the mineral diamond. In its natural state, it doesn't much resemble the sparkling gem in the jeweler's showcase. All minerals are not gems. All minerals do not have such high value. Value is a concept determined by man. Man's recognition of its polished beauty and natural hardness has made diamond one of the most valuable minerals.
of the fundamental characteristics of minerals is the fact that they occur naturally within the Earth's crust. They can be on the surface of the Earth's crust, as beach, soil, or desert sand, but most minerals occur as inherent components of rocks. At this distance, the rock appears homogeneous. The minerals quartz and feldspar are evident at this distance, as well as some mica, a familiar combination classified as granite. However, not all minerals are as common as those in granite. Many are extremely rare. This rare rock has the common mineral feldspar intergrown with rare nepheline. Both are white. Here, the blue mineral is sodalite, so rare that it occurs at only a few places in the entire crust of the earth. It is taken as a collector's item. On the surface of the earth as components of rocks, common and rare, in association with others, and calcite, in this instance, with no others. Acid effervesces on pure calcite. The Earth's crust contains over 2,500 naturally occurring minerals. In huge masses over thousands of square miles, or as uranophane. Minute, fragile needles in small holes with its fanning yellow crystals. Minerals occur in a variety of ways. the gemstone amethyst. Here, in a vug or cavity in the rock. Amazonite crystals on common feldspar. And in enormous deposits laid down by the saturated waters of ancient seas. Sodium and chlorine. Water from the Great Salt Lake in Utah is evaporated every summer in huge, flat pans, leaving tons of salt crystals to be packed and shipped to the tables and roads of North America. breathtaking landscape, the Nahani's legendary Headless Valley, a beautiful, incongruous sculpture, a mound of travertine nearly 50 meters high, deposited from solution over 10,000 years of a bubbling hot spring. Some gemstones can be cleaved or cut because, like all minerals, they are crystalline. In instances where minerals actually form crystals, their beauty is obvious. Crystal and crystalline, there is a difference. By definition, all minerals are crystalline. 
A solid substance, such as a mineral, is crystalline when its atoms have a highly ordered geometric structure. And when its atoms are regularly arrayed in repetition, like a pattern on three-dimensional wallpaper. Each mineral is built from minute building blocks of its highly ordered atomic structure called a unit cell. These are extended in three dimensions. If this three-dimensional extension of the unit cell reveals faces that are a reflection of its internal structure, then we have a crystal. Here, a crystal of halite, or natural salt. If, however, the unit cell is built so that faces are not a reflection of this internal structure, the structure is crystalline, not a crystal. Here, crystalline salt, or halite, the same mineral, but not a crystal. So all minerals are crystalline. They have a highly ordered crystalline structure. But they only form as crystals when this internal structure is revealed in reflection on their external surface or face. There are six types of building block which result in six crystal systems. Isometric, as in this pyrite crystal. Tetragonal. Here in a crystal of wolfenite. Orthorhombic. A crystal of bomberite. Hexagonal. A crystal of beryl. Monoclinic. Represented by a crystal of gypsum. And triclinic. a crystal of axonite. Each mineral must have as its basic building block one of these six types. Each mineral must belong to one of these six crystal systems. This is a piece of massive quartz. It is a mineral. It is a highly ordered atomic crystalline structure but it displays no external crystal form. This also is the mineral quartz. Its external crystal form is clearly visible, and it is, therefore, a crystal. From the crust of the Earth, exactly as they exist in nature, with an internal structure ordered and repeated to an infinite degree, crystals of minerals reveal to the human eye a beauty to forever challenge the creativity of man.
Man's awareness of minerals has not been a gift of this 20th century, but rather a heritage of his life on the planet. Recorded history abounds with evidence that the great progressive and significant peoples knew and studied minerals. Sumerian schoolboys memorized lists of minerals 2,200 years before the birth of Christ. Masterpieces of mineral usage were common with the ancient Egyptians, who have left us this oldest paper map of a gold mine in the desert east of the Nile Valley. The Jews recorded much about mineralogy in the Bible. Job, verses 1 and 2. Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. Iron is taken out of the earth and the brass is molten out of the stone. The first textbook on minerals, the Book of Stones, was authored by the Greek philosopher and naturalist Theophrastus about 300 years before Christ. Agricola. So comprehensively did he document the mining and processing of minerals in his book De Re Metallica that to this day it is unsurpassed. Through the ages, chemists have been identifying the inorganic chemicals of newfound minerals. Each mineral has its own chemical composition and formula. Some are very simple, consisting of only one element, such as gold. Some have two elements, such as pyrite, fool's gold. Others have formulas so complex and long that they become an apothecary's nightmare. The common mineral hornblende. But chemistry alone will not determine the mineral. The same chemical may form two or several minerals. If carbon forms in the crust of the earth and occurs in black hexagonal crystals, we have graphite. Because of its extreme softness, a very useful industrial mineral. If the carbon, however, experiences tremendous pressure in the crust of the earth, and the atoms of its crystalline structure are squeezed into a cubic array, it is now the mineral diamond, whose particular atomic configuration makes it the hardest mineral known to man. So, the combination of chemistry and crystal structure makes a mineral what it is. This combination identifies the substance not as animal or vegetable, but mineral. Man's continued experimentation with nature's gift of minerals has dramatically advanced his knowledge of their origin and the technology of their application. In high pressure temperature laboratories, it is possible to make minerals synthetically. In doing so, we can determine what pressure and temperature within the earth combined to form the natural mineral. It is often less expensive to synthetically reproduce minerals under controlled conditions than to mine natural ones. Synthetics may also be doped or modified with respect to color and other industrial requirements. Experimentation and increased knowledge of the origin of natural minerals has resulted in their synthetic application to ceramics, cements, glass, and a nearly limitless procession of new products, in addition to new gemstones. Yet man is still unable to fulfill the alchemist's dream to create the metal of the sun, gold. Minerals are physical things with physical properties. Apart from the food he ate, minerals were the first objects seen, pondered over, and used by man. He needed them for his very existence. He sheltered in caves cut from minerals. He fashioned tools and weapons from them. He cooked in them. He was once surrounded by them. He decorated his caves with them.
prehistoric Indians used minerals in a wide variety of ways. The peculiar properties of each mineral were adapted for a specific need. Man's understanding of the mineral wealth around him governed his technology. Anthropologists thus divide the history of man into a stone age during which implements were made of stone, a bronze age during which materials were made from an alloy of copper and tin, and an iron age after man had discovered and learned to smelt iron minerals. The clay that's being thrown to make this pot is an aggregate of ultra-fine grain minerals. When mixed with water, it is soft and pliable, ready to accept the craftsman's intuitive hands. When fired at high temperature, its physical properties change. It becomes very hard and serves well to contain liquids of all kinds. And when the craftsman turns his skill to glazing his creation, he is again using mineral products. Like the ancient Egyptians, this man knows the mineral products of his glazes add strength, bonding veneer and beauty to the final product. Greens and blues and reds from copper, cobalt and iron. Long, delicate, natural asbestos fiber, a mineral unaffected by fire, non-conducting and chemically resistant. A set of physical properties so in demand that its mining has long been an important industry. The asbestos ore is blasted loose at this open pit mine. Several crushing and drying stages free the asbestos from the rock. The pure asbestos fibers are used in a wide range of manufactured products. Physical properties of minerals are also useful in that they afford a means of identifying them readily and simply by the use of only a few inexpensive tools. Most minerals have a unique set of physical properties. Here, two yellow minerals. At first glance, they look very much alike. Yellow, soft, and not heavy. But sulfur is dull, and orpiment is pearly. They differ in luster the way in which they reflect light. Two hard, black, glassy minerals, hornblende and tourmaline. One has cleavage, the other doesn't. Beryl and apatite. Beryl, or emerald, is hard, while the apatite, used in fertilizer, is soft. These two minerals are very much alike. However, magnetite is magnetic and not radioactive, and uraninite is not magnetic, but highly radioactive. But the physical properties of minerals are not always constant. Sometimes they can vary and fool us. Color is an example. All quartz, for instance, isn't white, but it is always hard and glassy. Calcite white, pink, green, and amber, but always greasy. Halite, white, orange, pink, and blue, always salty. If a mineral cannot be identified by a simple examination of its physical properties, then more sophisticated means must be used. Under high power magnification, a mineral's optical characteristics may be determined the way in which light passes through it, 
X-ray will identify its crystalline structure, and in the laboratory, its chemistry may be analyzed. Gemstones are not special minerals, but rather unusual specimens of what are often ordinary, common minerals. The diamond cutter must obtain the most perfect stone possible and remove any portion containing flaws. If the cutter has carefully chosen his cleaving planes, the diamond will split easily along them. If there is an unusual specimen, if a lifetime has been spent apprenticing for the cutter's craft, if the flaws are removed, if nothing goes wrong in nature or in man, if the diamond can then be faceted and polished. The diamond as a gemstone. The object is to cut facets onto the stone that capture the maximum light and refract and reflect it back with optimum brilliance. Each facet is polished onto its surface with painstaking progression. A mixture of diamond dust and oil on a revolving wheel bites into the stone for this exacting and delicate stage of the process. The angles at which the facets are put on the stone are critical. Each must be identical for symmetry. Each must meet exactly with its neighbor. Checking for size. Checking for angle. Adjusting. Each facet must be perfect. The polisher contributes a concentrated effort, a craftsman's care and concern. Nature contributes a mineral. Together, they contribute a brilliant gemstone. Minerals are a resource of the earth. With a particular atomic structure and specific chemical composition, their physical and chemical properties have been used by man since his beginning. Without his vast knowledge and wide application of the planet's minerals, his very civilization could not exist. <laughs> Thank you.
minerals naturally occurring inorganic substances, about two and a half thousand of which are known in all, with a limited range of chemical composition that's subject to certain rules and which we can express with a chemical formula. Some minerals occur as crystals, such as this quartz and this galena, which is an ore of lead. But most minerals occur as the constituents of rocks, such as this granite here, which is composed of the minerals quartz, sometimes hornblende, quite often biotite mica, and always a pink potassium feldspar, microcline or orthoclase. Some minerals we know from their household use, such as salt, which occurs not as a component of a rock, but alone. And all minerals have a regular internal atomic structure, that is, they're crystalline, such as this regular atomic structure of salt represented in this model, in which each of the spheres represents an atom. Now, before we can really understand atomic models such as this, we need to know something about atoms. Atoms are the smallest part of an element which retains the properties of that element. So, for example, an atom of gold is the smallest particle of gold. An atom of tin is the smallest particle of tin, and so on. And by small, I mean small, really small. For example, this cube of sugar is about a centimeter square. This icing sugar has, is made up of powder, each grain of which is about a thousandth of a centimeter across. To get to an atom from that icing sugar, you would have to divide each particle by a thousand again, and you're still not finished. You must divide the result of that by a hundred. And by the time you've done that, you've divided the original cube of sugar by a hundred million, which means that along the edge of, between the corners of the cube of sugar, there are about a hundred million atoms. So each of the atoms in this model, the large purple chlorine atoms and the small yellow sodium atoms, are about a hundred millionth of a centimeter across, give or take a little bit. The sodium a little bit smaller and the chlorine's a little bit larger. Now it's difficult to imagine an atom, something as small as that, having an internal structure. But in fact, atoms do have an internal structure and quite a complex one. There are about 30 different kinds of particles making up an atom, but only three of these, fortunately, uh, are of great interest to us. So let's make an atom out of those three kinds of particles. The central part of an atom, called the nucleus, is formed of two of these three particles. Protons, which are colored red, and neutrons, which are dark colored. The protons, as the name implies, carry a positive electric charge. The neutrons, as you might guess from their name, carry no electric charge. Together, then, the nucleus of an atom is formed of neutrons and protons, and the total effect is for there to be a positive charge on that nucleus. It's this part of an atom which decays, breaks down, or transforms in radioactive minerals due to loss of particles from the nucleus. We can measure that rate of decay, and this is the basis of radiometric dating. Balancing the positive charge of the nucleus are electrons, which carry a negative charge. And to imagine the scale of this model, you would have to imagine the electrons distributed around the edge of a baseball field and the nucleus being like an orange in the center of that baseball field. In fact, the nucleus of an atom is about one ten thousandth the diameter from one side of the atom to the other. So that's what an atom looks like. It's extremely small, a nucleus in the center with a positive charge, electrons spinning around in what we call shells, each of the electrons with a negative charge, 
which, ne which neutralizes the positive charge of the nucleus. But that's just an atom. How are the atoms in a mineral, which is a combination of atoms, how are they held together? Well, the answer to this is in atomic bonds. Atomic bonds, if you like, are the glue of minerals. So let's take a look at the different kinds of atomic bonds. There are three, in fact. And we'll look first at salt, and then at the kind of bond there is in diamond, and finally at the kind that exists in copper. Let's look first at the atomic bonding in salt. Salt occurs as cubic crystals, and its internal structure is made up of atoms of sodium surrounded by six atoms of chlorine. And each chlorine is surrounded by six atoms of sodium. And this arrangement gives a definite pattern that we call the unit cell. And this unit cell, repeated, produces a regular framework that we call the lattice of salt. And it's here that we have to look for the explanation of how the structure of salt occurs. How are the atoms of sodium and chlorine bonded together in this regular pattern? Well, to achieve stability, like all atoms, sodium and chlorine try to get eight electrons in their outer shell. In chlorine, the outer shell however, only holds seven electrons, and there's room for one more. In the case of sodium, the outer shell only holds one electron. This is lost to the chlorine, which thus achieves stability by completing its outer shell of eight electrons. The electron carries with it a negative charge, so the chlorine is negatively charged. And the sodium, having lost a negative charge, becomes positively charged. And the positively charged sodium and the negatively charged chlorine, therefore, attract one another. In fact, they form, therefore, a bond. And it's this bond which holds the atoms of sodium and chlorine together. We call this an ionic bond. And it's this ionically bonded structure which makes up the cubic form of salt. Let's take another cubic crystal structure of diamond, pure carbon. Although it's cubic like the salt, both the bonding and the arrangement of atoms in diamond are very different from salt. Within the unit cell, each carbon atom is attached to four others in the form of a, a tetrahedron. Now let's look at these bonds that link together the members of the tetrahedron. A carbon atom only has four electrons in its outermost shell. And it achieves stability by sharing electrons with four other carbon atoms. And this sharing, elec sharing of electrons forms a second and rather stronger type of bond that we call a covalent bond. And it's this covalent bonding which produces the, the structure uh, of diamond, and what makes diamond so very hard. This is why diamonds are used in cutting materials, for example, glass cutters. But there's another kind of carbon which is familiar to us, and carbon evidently then occurs in two kinds of crystal forms. We say it's polymorphic. The graphite structure which is what is in pencils, is flat and sheet-like, and the layers slide easily over one another, and this is why graphite has the properties it has. They slide over one another because although the atoms within the sheets, the carbon atoms in the sheets, are bonded strongly, the layers themselves are only lightly held together by thin, what you might call, electron clouds. And this is a, a weak kind of bond that we call a semi-metallic form of bonding, we see this kind of bonding much better in copper. 
in copper, which also has a cubic structure, the atoms are closely packed together at the corners of cubes and also at the center of each face of the cube. And we call this face-centered cubic. And the copper atom has four electron shells. The first three are complete, but the outer shell only contains a single electron. And being farthest from the positive charge of the nucleus, this electron is not very strongly held. And it breaks away and moves at random throughout the copper. In this way, a, a sort of a cloud of negative electrons is formed. And the individual atoms, which are now positive because they've lost the negatively charged electron, are held together by what you might call the pressure of this electron cloud. This is the metallic bond, the third kind of bond. So the atoms of minerals are held together by one of three kinds of bonds, the ionic, the covalent, or the metallic. And the kind of bond and the way that the atoms are packed together controls the physical properties of the mineral. And by physical properties, we mean those properties that we can see or touch or feel, or if you feel so inclined, can taste. And salt is a good example of this. If we try to break salt, we find that salt always breaks with flat, shiny planes, which form sharp corners or a cubic structure or cubic shape. And that breakage of salt, and we call that cleaving, the breakage along natural planes within the salt um, <coughs> crystal, is caused by the internal structure of salt. The breakage takes place here, here, and here. So salt has three cleavage planes, all at right angles, which produce sharp cornered um, fragments when you break the salt. The attraction between the sodium and the chlorine atoms, the ionic bonds of the structure, is broken at the midpoints of the bonds. And since the atoms are arranged in a cubic structure, then so the breakage planes are arranged in a cubic structure. Another mineral which has got a very well-defined cleavage is mica, muscovite mica, which breaks in sheets. And you can peel off pieces of muscovite mica without any problem at all. In other words, mica has one well-defined cleavage plane. It breaks in one direction to make flat sheets. And the reason for that lies in the atomic structure of the mica, just like it did in the salt. And here we've got two models, one here and another here, atomic models of muscovite mica. In this model, the size of the atoms is shown by the size of the balls. So this is a, an atom of oxygen. This is a much larger atom of potassium. And if we open up the model, you can see small atoms of aluminum, which are red, and here large uh, representatives of water. In this model, on the other hand, the atoms are not given their correct size in proportion to one another. The atoms are treated all as the same size, and the different elements are indicated by different colors. So this is oxygen, this is silicon, and this is potassium. In the other model, the silicon atoms were quite hidden in between the groups of oxygen atoms, and we couldn't see them. So this model has got some advantages. And the distance between the atoms is indicated by the length of the wire spokes between the wooden balls. So this is a short link. This is a relatively short link. But this link here is very long. And it's here that the muscovite breaks. In the 
area or at the level of the long weak bonds between oxygen and potassium. In this model, that breakage level is here. So one sheet of mica is here on this model between two layers of weakly bonded potassium atoms and on this model that is a sheet of muscovite mica. Sheets which reflect this atomic structure can be seen in the top right hand corner of this specimen. There are of course thousands of atomic sheets in each of those cleavage sheets but the breakage is at the same place, at the level of the potassium atoms, because the potassium atoms are the only link between as many as six atoms in one sheet and six atoms in another sheet. And just like trying to shake hands with 12 people, this is a pretty weak link in the covalent mica structure. Now, a mineral with quite different properties to mica is quartz. In the specimen of quartz, there are no cleavage planes like there were in the mica, no cleavage planes as there were in the salt. The quartz breaks rather like glass, irregularly. And we say that the quartz fractures rather than cleaves. And the reason for that is found in the atomic structure of quartz, of which this is a model. And don't be misled by the long spokes between the black silicon atoms. That's just to hold the thing together. The quartz structure is a three-dimensional arrangement of oxygen, which are the red atoms, and silicon, which are the black atoms. And there are no natural breakage planes within that atomic structure, as there were in the muscovite. There's nowhere for the quartz to break, if you like, so that it just breaks any old way. And it has no cleavage planes. So the way that a mineral breaks, whether it cleaves or whether it fractures, is controlled by the internal structure of the mineral. If there are weakly bonded natural planes of breakage, the mineral cleaves. If there are not, then the mineral fractures. Now the internal structure of minerals also controls the way that the mineral appears when it grows as crystals. The crystal form, the external form of the mineral, another physical property, then is also controlled by the internal structure. There are 32 basically different shapes in which we find crystals. Each of these shapes formed by the unit cells of the individual minerals. For example, this is the unit cell of salt. These are the corners. And there. And that unit cell can build cubes simply by piling more cubes, more little cubes, uh, together. But it can also form a quite different shape, indicated by this model. Each of these black squares representing the sides of a cube. And in this case, the cubes are built up into a pyramid. And you may say, well, uh, <coughs> this has got very obvious steps to it. And of course it has. But remember that the size of these steps is about a hundred millionth of a centimeter. And the um, <coughs> Steps are therefore, when we look at a crystal, quite impossible to see. So the sides of a crystal built like that, this arrangement of cubic unit cells would seem to be us, to us to be quite smooth. Now, those 32 basically different shapes are grouped into six crystal systems, as we say. And here are representatives of two of those crystal systems, the cubic and the hexagonal. And the basically different shapes which belong to these two different crystal systems are characterized by certain what we call planes and axes of symmetry. That is, planes which divide the crystal into um, <coughs> regular shapes. For example, this is a cube and there is a plane of symmetry. 
In other words, if we take a knife and we chop the cube in half, we have a right hand and a left hand mirror image. The same way as if you were to chop me down the middle, there'd be a right and a left half. So there's a plane of symmetry right through the center of a, of a person and right through the center of a cube. There are others in a cube as well. There's one across here, there's one across there, one across there, one across the middle, one down there, one down there. There are many planes of symmetry which one can cut through to form two symmetrical mirror image parts of a cube. Now, cube is easy. Um, to do it with different shapes would be rather complicated, and we shan't do that. We'll stick to demonstrating the planes of symmetry with a cube. There are also um, <coughs> elements of symmetry that we call axes. And an axis of symmetry is an axis, or if you like, like an axle in a, in a car, around which we can rotate the crystal and see similar faces. So in a cube, we can rotate the, uh, the shape around an axis that goes straight through the middle, rather like a knitting needle. And in order for a crystal shape to belong to the cubic crystal system, it must have certain axes of symmetry. And we can demonstrate these with this model in which all the important axes are shown. There is the one around which we rotated this model, that is here. There's this one around which we can rotate the cube. And then there's also this one around which we can rotate it. There are three axes then of symmetry to the quartz, uh, to, the, to the cube, which characterize the cubic crystal system. This is a, another shape, which at first doesn't look obviously cubic, which also has three axes, one, two, and three. So this shape belongs also to the cubic crystal system. Now, it's important when looking at the shapes not to be misled by the overall impression. What's important is that one look at the angles between the various faces. We can demonstrate this with reference to the hexagonal crystal system to which quartz belongs. In this case, this is a quartz crystal which is quite perfect in shape. And if we were to take a slice out of it and measure the angles between the faces here, we'd find it was 120 degrees. And we can see that very well on the cross section. 120 degrees between perfectly developed faces, all of equal size. But consider this example. The only difference between this shape and this one is that the crystal faces are of different size. The angle between them is not different. So the angle between this long face and this short one is 120 degrees, the same as it was 120 degrees here. And the same with this shape, which at first is not obviously hexagonal. This face and this face form an angle of 120 degrees. And the same with this shape here. So it's important then to examine the angles between the faces of crystals. The way that we do this is to take a crystal, here is a crystal of quartz, and to put the crystal against an instrument we call a goniometer. And in this case, we'd measure 120 degrees, 120, 120. So that gives you an idea of the way in which we arrange different crystal shapes into groups that we call systems. Now, we've been looking at the crystals themselves, their external form, their shapes. Minerals usually occur in rocks, and in this case, we can't see the crystal form, and we must look at the minerals with a microscope. It's quite a different way of looking at minerals. And in order to look at the minerals that are in rocks, we usually use a microscope. 
and it's necessary first to prepare what we call a thin section. The first step is to cut a slice from the rock using a diamond-edged saw. The slices are then cemented to glass slides and ground until they're paper thin. The resulting thin sections allow light to pass through them quite easily and can be examined then under the microscope. When we look at a thin section of rock under the microscope, we generally employ polarized light, which we produce by using two sheets of Polaroid. Now, you're familiar with this material as a material which produces uh, good sunglasses. In the microscope, we use two sheets. If we have them in both in the same direction, we see nothing. Rotate one, the light comes through. Rotate again, black. Each sheet of Polaroid cuts out the light vibrating in one direction, a rather peculiar material. One sheet of Polaroid is in here in the microscope, another is beneath here, and the thin section between has the effect of twisting and bending the light, and the net result of this is that each mineral grain in the rock, when we look down the microscope, is characterized by a different color. In this thin section of an igneous rock, the interlocking nature of the grains is seen quite clearly. The polarized light causes the quartz grains to be black and white and shades of gray, and the large lath-shaped crystal in the center of the screen is biotite. And the black lines along its length are the cleavage. Using polarized light makes the crystals very much more clear than in plain light, when the thin section looks colorless. So the mineral grains in igneous rocks are interlocking, which is what we'd expect from a rock that had cooled from a molten fluid. We look at igneous rocks and the minerals they contain in more detail next week. But in the meantime, I hope you will have carefully unpacked and studied your mineral kit. Take the specimens out simply by slitting the plastic. It's best to take them out one at a time so you can get the correct numbers on the specimens. And in order to store them, you might like to try an old egg box.